I'm grateful to our music director, Elikum, and also Ingrid and Bethany and Tom for being with us this morning. Will you pray with me? O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I struggle to find Michelle as I leave my therapy office. It's dark and cold and I can't figure out where she's parked. So I trudge off in the direction that she indicated, stepping carefully to avoid those icy patches and the piles of snow. It's hard to tell who anyone is in these winter months of the pandemic. Everyone's bundled up, wrapped in scarves and coats and masks. But eventually I see Michelle's energetic curls bouncing toward me. We share an awkward pandemic greeting. I don't know if you all have developed your pandemic greeting yet. Mine is sort of enthusiastically waving with both hands. Michelle and I are both huggers, so it feels strange to greet her without a physical touch. We walk and talk for a bit, bearing the cold for just a chance to catch up. After a while, she presents me with a nicely wrapped bag, an ordination gift. Inside are two beautiful palm crosses crosses that are meant to be held as you pray or worship. They're carved from olive wood, wood that's been pruned from olive trees in the holy city of Bethlehem. The wood is a tan color marbled through with streaks of darker brown. And these crosses fit neatly in the palm of my hand. Oh, and they're smooth to the touch, a wonderfully tactile reminder of God's presence. I held one of these crosses in my palm last Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. It was around 9 p.m. and I was on the couch in my pajamas after a really long day at my clinical therapy practice. I'd propped my phone up on a couch cushion and pulled up a worship service that had been posted on Instagram of all places. I lit a match and let it burn for a few seconds before snuffing it out. And then I sort of carefully crushed up the burnt bits to make a small pile of ashes that I then ceremoniously placed on the rim of my dinner plate that quite frankly still had leftovers of food stuck to it. And I took a deep breath and I hoped that this would work, that somehow God would show up in the intersection of my phone and my makeshift ashes and unclean dishes. And I considered that cross in my hand, carved and sanded smooth. It's similar in shape to the cross of Jesus, but the resemblance stops there. The original cross was rough, heavy, splintered, an instrument of torture. That cross is what our text says was the inevitable result of Jesus's ministry. I don't know if you caught it, but Mark 831 reads, and Jesus began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. The son of man must suffer. The original Greek is day, meaning necessary. The scripture tells us that it is necessary that Jesus suffer. 
right before our gospel lesson for today begins, Jesus asks a question of his disciples. Who do people say that I am? It's a good question. And apparently people had a lot of opinions because the disciples' answers range from John the Baptist to Elijah. And Jesus then asks a secondary question. Who do you say that I am? To which Peter answers, the Christ. Now on the surface level, Peter's correct. Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of Man, Emmanuel, God with us. But it turns out that Peter and likely other disciples don't really know what that means. Because when Jesus, in today's scripture that we heard read, when Jesus defines Messiah, when Jesus tells them that the Messiah will suffer and bleed and die, Peter rebukes him. It can be hard for us to understand Peter's reaction. If you're like me, you, you hear the scripture story and you're kind of going, oh no, Peter, don't do that. It's hard for us to understand because we already know the end of the story, right? We know that it's Lent right now. We know that Good Friday is coming, and we know that Easter is on the other side. But Peter and the original disciples don't know any of that. Jesus' definition of Christ goes against everything the disciples expected. It basically explodes the category. A savior isn't supposed to suffer. A Messiah isn't supposed to be beaten down. A God isn't supposed to die. Jesus's words profoundly disturb the disciples not only because of what it means for their dear rabbi Jesus, but also because of what it means for them. And they've given this man their allegiance, and he's going to be persecuted and die? That will have implications for each and every one of them as followers and friends. So if you can imagine just a piece of what the disciples must have been feeling, perhaps you can understand why Peter rebukes Jesus in this moment. Jesus responds, get behind me, Satan. Oof, every time I read that verse, it feels a bit like a smack in the face. Jesus does not mince words in that moment. He is not playing around. Get behind me. Don't you dare tempt me with a different kind of kingship. Don't you dare tempt me with earthly power. Don't you dare tempt me with political prowess. Don't you dare tempt me to leave my mission to the poor and the blind and the captive, no matter where it leads. What does it mean that Jesus must suffer? Well, Jesus's mission is at the root of his passion on that cross. Jesus must suffer because his mission puts him in opposition to those with power. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is steadfast in his fellowship with the disinherited. He is fully devoted to healing the broken, to liberating the oppressed, and to seeing the full humanity of all people. And this mission challenges the social and political structures that will eventually crucify him. What does it mean that Jesus must suffer? It's a critical question for us. 
Because before we can understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Messiah, we must understand what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah. Jesus must suffer because he was devoted to his mission. And Jesus must suffer because he was human. Jesus was flesh and blood just like us. This is the truth at the heart of the Lenten season. Remember that these 40 days that we're at the start of are a reflection of the 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. And Satan tempted his humanity saying, your human body is hungry. Use your power to change stones into bread. Oh, your human body, it's fragile. Let angels keep you from feeling pain. Your human body is finite. Command all kingdoms to surrender to you. And Jesus said no every single time because Jesus committed himself to knowing us, humans, fully. Jesus had to suffer because to be human is to encounter suffering. I held my palm cross on Ash Wednesday, and that's what I thought about. I thought about suffering. And my mind turned to Ash Wednesday last year. Do you remember Ash Wednesday last year? <laughs> it was the last holy day that I spent in person with you. And Tom, it's so fitting that you're here this morning because you played for Ash Wednesday. And on that day, we prayed and we thought about ashes and we reminded ourselves that we are dust. And we entered into Lent, and I thought that Lent was only going to be 40 days. Lent has been 368 days, as far as I'm concerned. This has been the longest Lent of my life. We've spent 368 days in the ashes We've spent 368 days being made so very aware that to be human involves suffering. I felt the pang of that human suffering when Al died. I felt the pang when there were no pancakes and eggs in the social hall on Easter morning. I felt the pang when members of our congregation got sick. I felt the pain when Noah and I had to cancel the wedding that we had dreamed about. I felt the pain as I sat in my therapy office and I witnessed person after person after person struggle with depression. I felt the pain as I struggled with depression. I felt the pain of canceled proms and graduations and college moves ins and birthdays and births and funerals and just normal Sunday mornings. So this Ash Wednesday, I clutched my palm cross and I smeared crumbled up ashes on my forehead and I cried. As theologian Kate Bowler asked, what do we know about the world now that we know that God bleeds and dies? And what do we know about the world and each other now that we know that we need to be saved and the world must be saved and it must be saved by love? In the scripture, Jesus calls to the crowd. Beyond just his initial 12 disciples, he calls to all, if anyone would come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever would save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for my sake 
and the gospel's sake, we'll save it. Jesus' call to us is both a challenge and a comfort. It's a challenge because it requires us to acknowledge that we can't save our own lives. We can't save it with money or a bigger garage. We can't save it with green smoothies and marathons. We can't save it with straight A's or five-star reviews or working harder. We can only come to salvation by picking up our cross, a cross that was an instrument of oppression, but that like that olive wood in my palm has been worn smooth by love. We come to salvation for ourselves and for the world by walking the path of Jesus, the path of love for neighbor, love for justice, love for ourselves, love for the poor, love even for our enemies. Oh, my beloved, it's a challenge to do that. But it's also a comfort because it means that God intimately knows our hurts. A God who bleeds and dies knows what it's like to be scared and in pain and to grieve. And that is such a comfort to me in this longest Lent because I know, I know that there's nothing I can't bring to the foot of the cross. And of course, to be human isn't only suffering. That's part of Lent too. To know full humanity and to be human, it's also laughter and joy and intimacy. The cross reminds us that suffering is real. But as the Reverend Nadia Bowles Weber puts it, it's not the realest thing. Love is the realest thing. And love wins the day. And so to be human isn't only to hurt, it's also going out to Piccolo Mundo with Gene Krell and eating gnocchi. <laughs> it's slipping and sliding down a mountain of ice with Tim Smith. It's hearing Ingrid sing and Elicum and Tom and Bethany play in our sanctuary. It is laughing so hard with Pastor Veronica that my sides start to hurt. It's holding Noah's hand at the end of the day. My friends, we enter another 40 days of Lent, a wilderness that lays bare our humanness and our need for salvation as if we didn't know it after this year. But as we pick up our cross, may we do so with the knowledge that it ultimately transforms us, making us image bearers of the love of God that is the realest thing. Amen. <laughs>